Once a devout Christian, John had always been sure of his faith. However, as he entered college, John found himself surrounded by new ideas and perspectives that challenged his beliefs. Initially, John tried to ignore these doubts and continue with his faith as usual. It started with petty harmless, but vexatious jibes like, you really didn't think that a donkey really spoke to a prophet, or that a whale actually swallowed Jonah. The questioning and mocking soon shifted to the core doctrines of Christianity. John realized that he knew nothing of the validity of the Bible, the existence of God, and even the concept of salvation. He started to doubt his own faith, and felt isolated from friends and family. He felt guilty for his lack of faith and didn't know how to reconcile it with his past beliefs. He even began to resent God for allowing him to doubt. John's struggles with his faith went on for months, and he began to feel hopeless. This is a familiar story that has played out since time immemorial. Mark 6 6 says, And he marveled because of their unbelief. What is there in unbelief or doubt, which made even the Lord Jesus, the Son of God marvel? Before I continue, I have a favor to ask of you. If you have not already subscribed, please support our work by doing so, and share the video with family and friends. Thank you. Let me start by saying. All Christians, like you and me, go through moments when we struggle with doubts, and our faith isn't as strong as we would like it to be. We all go through what has been described by some as the spiritual mountaintop, and the spiritual valley experience. Elijah, had a mountaintop experience when he defeated the prophets of Baal. Then he descended into the valley experience when he struggled with fear, depression, and a desire to die. John the Baptist was at the mountaintop when he baptized Jesus. Then he was forced to confront his doubt as to whether Jesus was actually the Savior. So it is natural that people have honest doubts about their faith. We should be ready, as Christians, to help such people find the answers they need, so that their faith may be strengthened. Let me say that unbelief is a spiritual condition, that is only peculiar to humans. The angels in heaven, the fallen angels in hell, and the saints awaiting resurrection, as well as lost souls waiting for judgment. All these groups have one thing in common, they all believe. Unbelievers, be they atheists or agnostics, who have died, now believe in God. Bible says the rich man died and lifted his eyes from hell. And begged that the gospel should be preached to his brothers so they would believe. James says, the devils believe and tremble, James 2.19. Unfortunately, the only intelligent creature who does not believe is the person who is alive today. Should such a man or woman die, there would be no doubt in their minds that God is. So the atheist Voltaire now knows that there is a sin-hating God. Someone has said, a dead Hottentot knows more than a living Socrates. What causes our beliefs to falter? First, ignorance of the Word of God and the God of the Word. Unbelief starts in our mind. We usually refuse to accept anything we cannot understand. So when we come across such doctrines such as the Trinity, the Incarnation, the Atonement, the Holy Spirit, the Resurrection, we view them with cold indifference or we absolutely reject them. If you do not know, it is understandable if you stand in doubt. However, you cannot say because you do not fully understand them. You don't believe in them. Second, sin can drive us to unbelief. Another avenue for unbelief stems from the heart. There are certain sins and habits of life that we love. Which the Bible condemns? But we are determined not to give them up. So we take refuge from an uneasy conscience by trying to persuade ourselves that the Bible is not true. Whatever condemns our lusts, 
we refuse to believe. Lord Rochester, who was once an unbeliever, and later became a Christian, has said. It is not reason, but a bad life which is the great argument against the Bible. Because we know if we believe the doctrines of sin and hell, we must give up our favorite sins. Third, poor Bible study and prayer life. For others, unbelief stems from a lazy, indolent will. Because they are lazy they cannot cultivate the discipline of Bible reading and prayer. They are too lazy to diligently watch over their thought and words and deed. The only way they can escape the guilt of the conscience is to deny the truthfulness of the Bible. A lazy attitude towards Bible study, meditation, prayer breeds unbelief. Such Christians have a lack of knowledge or understanding of their faith without a solid understanding of what they believe and why. It can be difficult for individuals to maintain their faith in the face of opposition or doubt. Fourth, others drift away from the faith due to personal struggles or hardships. Difficult life experiences, such as the loss of a loved one, financial struggles, or health problems, can cause people to question their faith and feel angry or resentful toward God. Sixth, others drift away because of pressure from others. When we are in a social or cultural environment that is hostile to our faith, or we feel intense pressure from friends or family to reject our beliefs. It can lead some individuals to deny their faith. How can we restore our faith? First, desire to know God. As a Christian you need to know the God you have confessed faith in. You cannot have faith in a stranger. And the only way to know God is through His Word and His creation. God says in Jeremiah 29:13, You will seek me and find me, when you seek me with all your heart. A person who has honest doubts will make an effort to seek answers. And when he does not find them will ask for help. Such a person would be assisted and pointed in the right direction. Second, we must be grounded in the Word of God. So then faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the word of God, Romans 10:17. You should be meditating on God's word of life. You must meditate because the growth and strength of your faith depend on ingestion, and assimilation of his living and active word. The psalmist says. How can a young man cleanse his way? By taking heed according to your word, Psalm 119:9. Third, you must give yourself to prayer. As we communicate with God through prayer, we build an intimate relationship with Him. We bring to Him our fears, insecurities and doubts. And He, through the agency of His Holy Spirit, sheds His light abroad in our hearts. This dispels our doubts and strengthens our faith in Him more and more even as we begin to see him answer our prayers. Fourth, have a healthy and vibrant fellowship with the brethren. Proverbs 27:17 says, As iron sharpens iron, so a man sharpens the countenance of his friend. Good Christians fellowship encourages and supports us. Hebrews 10 says, Let us think of ways to motivate one another to acts of love and good works. And let us not neglect our meeting together, as some people do, but encourage one another, especially now that the day of his return is drawing near. Fifth, avoid foolish arguments that do not glorify God. Paul says, Have nothing to do with foolish, ignorant controversies, you know that they breed quarrels. 2 Timothy 2.23 But rather, Sanctify the Lord God in your hearts, and always be ready to give a defense to everyone who asks you a reason for the hope that is in you, with meekness and fear, 1 Peter 3:15. Finally, trust God. Choose to believe in God's faithfulness, even when everything seems to us to be hopeless. He has done it before and He will do it again. 
He is a God who cannot lie. God bless you.